Okay, so this is a wonderful conference. There are a lot of really interesting talks I've been listening to. Um, and so um, uh, I think I should start because of that reminding with some things about uh, yesterday because you know there's a lot of interesting information. Uh, so uh, this is about dynamic contracts and the uh, broad idea is um, dynamic adverse selection. So these are situations where the agent has some uh, uh, private information. So it could be that uh, uh, he comes to the principal and already has some private information. It could be that he acquires some private information over time. Uh, it could be that uh, um, uh, he creates some private information through um, actions which are uh, not observed by, by the principal. So uh, in the particular uh, model that I've talked about yesterday, the private information was about hidden savings. Um, and uh, the principal knows that he wants to create incentives for the agent not to save, but uh, the agent could uh, deviate and create savings and, uh, and then what matters is uh, uh, the agent's uh, payoff. So in all of these settings, dynamic adverse selection, um, what matters is basically the payoff of a deviating type. Okay, so uh, the agent uh, um, has uh, uh, some expected uh, payoff on the equilibrium path. The principle is should be concerned about the payoff of the agent if it were a different type of an agent. So for example, uh, if the principal is selling cars, then uh, uh, what matters is uh, um, uh, if, uh, uh, if, it's a, if it's a basic car uh, and if uh, the principal wants to extract rents from a high valuation buyer, then maybe the principal wants to make the car worse uh, so that to reduce the payoff of a higher valuation buyer from buying a car intended for, for a low valuation buyer. So basically, the whole function, uh, the agent's payoff function is a function of his type uh, matters. Okay? And here, it's going to be about the, the value of savings. Okay? Uh, what is going to be the agent's payoff uh, of uh, having savings? And uh, uh, the, the agent's payoff of having savings, uh, that depends on uh, uh, his expectation of the future. Okay, so if the agent expects uh, the future to be risky, if his precautionary motive is large, then he wants to save, and then his payoffs of, of savings will be larger. Okay, uh, so the specific model, uh, is that uh, there is a principal and an agent, and uh, the agent uh, manages some assets. Okay, so the manage, manages some capital K. Uh, the principal can determine how much capital the agent gets to manage. Uh, and uh, the agent gets some return from um, managing this capital. The agent has special skill, so he can generate some alpha. Okay. But uh, there is a moral hazard problem because the agent can get some private benefit by uh, reducing the returns. So, uh, so here, you know, we can think about in, in this specific model, it's, uh, it's like the agent is diverting some of the resources, the agent is stealing, and uh, uh, so the concern is that the agent could uh, reduce the return and steal and save. Okay, so the agent also has some, some hidden savings. Okay. And uh, there is a risky asset that uh, the agent is investing in. So uh, the risky investment uh, can be monitored by the principal, except that the agent can secretly divert funds from risky investment and put it into a secret uh, savings account. Okay. Uh, and uh, this setting is... Um, uh, 
cl uh, classic because it's related to a portfolio choice. Well, the the hidden savings problem is 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 a new. It's a it's a it's a uh, it's the new, but the uh, the investment, the portfolio allocation between uh, uh, risky asset and uh, risk-free asset is a very classic problem. Okay, and uh, this classic problem has some uh, uh, nice uh, uh, scale invariance uh, uh, properties, which uh, which which can help. Okay, and uh, uh, so. How does it help to have these uh, uh, scale invariance properties? Um, so, so in any principal agent problem, there is a principal and an agent. Okay, uh, and so when we analyze a principal agent problem, so this is the um, formulation of a problem. So the principal is going. The problem is that the principal is going to design a contract for the agent. And the contract is going to specify the agent's compensation and uh, uh, how much resources the agent is given as a function of hi the history of performance uh, subject to uh, the agent's incentive constraints. So the agent, he's going to face the contract and then the agent is going to uh, optimize given the contract. So this is a double optimization problem. Okay. Uh, it's a double optimization problem because the principal is optimizing, recognizing that uh, given the contract, the agent will be optimizing later. Okay, uh, and so we have to understand the agent's optimization, and we have to understand the principal's optimization. Okay, um, and uh, we have to understand uh, which one should we understand better. So we actually should understand the agent's optimization a lot better. Okay, that's that's the one that that uh, we have to understand very generally, and and why it's because uh, uh, the you're looking for the optimal contract. The principal can design any contract, and so for any contract, we have to understand uh, what the agent is going to do. Uh, in order to uh, in order to uh, respond in order to, to figure out in order to figure out what is the best contract we have to basically understand how the agent uh, acts uh, under any contract okay uh, and so if we have uh, um, some structure of the problem some scale invariance where it's going to help is it's going to help for analyzing the principal's problem. But it's not really going to help us much with analyzing the agent's problem because we have to understand the, the agent's problem uh, very generally. Okay. Uh, and so, um, okay. So, uh, So how can we analyze the agent's problem? So the agent's problem, uh, the agent has some incentive constraints. Uh, so uh, basically, the agent is choosing uh, action, how much to divert, and, and the agent can save. Okay. So uh, there are two sets of incentive constraints one for uh, stealing and uh, uh, one for saving. Okay, uh, and uh, And what's the result here? So the result here is that in any uh, um, consider an arbitrary contract, and uh, uh, consider uh, an agent strategy given the contract. Okay, 
what does it take for the uh, agent strategy to be optimal given the contract? Well, so it has to be the case that uh, uh, the incentive constraint with respect to uh, A is satisfied and uh, the Euler equation is satisfied. So those conditions are uh, necessary for um, those conditions are necessary for the agent's response to, uh, to the contract to be optimal. And then there are some, some other conditions. So these are just the first order conditions there. The agent can have uh, a lot of other uh, potential uh, deviations, okay? And so uh, in, in analyzing the agent's problem, we have uh, uh, necessary conditions. These are necessary. Um, and then uh, there will be other conditions, uh, sufficient conditions, okay? And these are also general conditions, okay? And basically what we have is that we have a, uh, um, uh, uh, So we have the class of all contracts, okay? So I guess this is something that, uh, you know, was, I was listening to the talks and this is something that I think like you understand, uh, some of you probably understand this much better than I. But we have a class of all contracts because this is the approach that, that I've heard. We have a class of all contracts and out of these contracts, there are uh, contracts which basically satisfy these conditions. Okay, so the, uh, these, are, these are the uh, contracts which satisfy the necessary uh, first order incentive compatibility conditions. Okay, and then in uh, uh, some of these contracts, they also satisfy sufficient conditions. Okay, so the, these also satisfy the sufficient conditions. Um, and then there are some others which maybe we don't know if uh, they're fully incentive compatible or not. They satisfy the necessary conditions, but... Um, and so, and then um, we can look for the optimal contract. So we go and we find the optimal contract and, and if you're lucky, then it's here. Okay, right. Uh, but... Uh, so... Um, So one feature of this setting is going to be that uh, so it's a, it's a scale invariant setting, right? Uh, but uh, this analysis basically doesn't really depend on scale invariance. Uh, but The principles problem is, is also a, a fairly complicated problem and the principles problem has scale invariance. And because the principles problem has scale invariance, we can uh, 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 characterize the optimal contract uh, uh, quite specifically, okay? And because of that, we can tell that it's gonna fall in this, uh, in this blue circle here, okay? All right, uh, so this, you know, one perspective. So, okay, um, so, so the agent has um, uh, uh, a scale invariant investment technology, the agent has hidden savings, the agent has uh, CRRA utility, the principal is observing the history of returns, which uh, depend on uh, uh, the noise and they potentially depend on the uh, agent's diversion actions. Uh, and as a function of the history of returns, the principal is specifying how much capital the agent is given and how to uh, compensate the agent, okay? So, uh, there are some specific contracts um, that we can look at. So, one of the contracts is basically what 
a utility with the uh, agent achieve an author key. And in author key, this is just a portfolio allocation problem. The agent is choosing how much to allocate in the risky technology versus the uh, risk-free assets. So it's a, it's a standard problem, okay? Um, and uh, relative to author key, one easy way how the principal can do better is uh, by giving the agent a fixed level of insurance. So what the principal can do is that the principal can uh, uh, monitor the, uh, the agent's wealth um, and uh, swap a portion of a, a stochastic growth of the agent's wealth for basically sure growth, okay? Um, and then uh, uh, figuring out uh, what, uh, what are the equations that the parameters have to satisfy uh, in order for this to be incentive compatible is, and for, in order for the principal to break even, this can be done using the same equations as uh, the equations for uh, static, uh, uh, for the author key uh, solution. This is uh, static optimal consumption and portfolio choice, okay? Uh, but uh, the point here is that uh, giving the agent a little bit of insurance is always um, beneficial. So uh, a static contract that gives the agent some level of insurance can improve over author key. Uh, and the argument why uh, uh, giving a little bit of insurance to the agent is beneficial is that uh, insurance uh, has a first order benefit on the agent's utility, it's good for the agent, apart from the moral hazard it creates. And uh, the moral hazard it creates is it basically distorts the agent's portfolio allocation relative to author key. So in the author key, it's optimal portfolio allocation, but here it distorts, and it distorts the agent's consumption rate, okay? But uh, the effects of those distortions are initially uh, second order, have a second order effect, so uh, some insurance is, uh, is helpful. Okay, um, and then I was saying that in, a, um, uh, in this uh, stationary contract, it's difficult to disentangle uh, distortions and uh, uh, incentives, okay? Uh, and uh, And, and the thing about distortions and incentives is uh, we basically have to look at this uh, uh, incentive constraint in order to uh, disentangle uh, distortions and incentives. So uh, in this incentive constraint, uh, delta is uh, uh, how the agent's utility changes with uh, 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 realized return. So this is the utility on the equilibrium path, not, not the deviation utility. Okay. So uh, this is the agent's risk exposure. Okay. Uh, and uh, the agent's incentives, they depend on his current risk exposure. Uh, and on the, on the right-hand side, this is... Um, uh, the agent's precautionary motive. So this is the, this is the agent's consumption. Um, and the intuition behind this incentive constraint is that uh, uh, when uh, the agent uh, expects to face a lot of risk in the future, then uh, uh, he wants to build up savings and so he is tempted to uh, steal and to build up savings. And in order to prevent that, the principal has to uh, punish the agent uh, stronger right now for um, uh, for lower returns. Okay. So. Um,
Okay. So, um, so I'm going to solve this model in a moment, but there are two things at play. So, uh, one of the things at play is uh, uh, the current risk exposure, and uh, another thing at play is uh, future risk exposure. Um, and uh, in, uh, in stationary contracts, uh, uh, so basically in stationary contracts, the, the agent's risk exposure is constant over time. Okay. Uh, so in, in stationary contracts, the risk exposure, uh, so how to think about risk exposure? You can think about risk exposure as basically the portfolio weight and the risky asset. Okay. Um, so in a, in a stationary contract, the risk exposure is the same at all times. Um, and uh, in a stationary contract, what ends up being beneficial is uh, going, moving towards less capital, so providing the agent with, uh, uh, with some insurance and reducing the portfolio weight and the, and the risky asset. And uh, moving in this direction is beneficial because it... Um, uh, because it, um, because it reduces the agent's uh, precautionary motive and uh, uh, weakens the incentive constraint. And uh, because of that, uh, you can give the agent. Uh, uh, so, okay, so let's, let's look at this incentive constraint, okay? So, um, there is a, so apart from this term, there is a linear relationship between uh, uh, the agent's risk exposure and how much capital you can, you can trust him with, okay? Um, and so, uh, so relative to, to author key, you can, uh, you can basically try to scale up the, uh, the agent's fund by uh, giving him more capital and also exposing him to proportionately more risk, okay? So, so then if you do that, it's not going to be incentive compatible because the agent is exposed to more risk uh, and therefore he has a greater precautionary motive so his consumption is going to go down and this incentive constraint will be violated. So moving in the direction of more capital, you have to expose the agent for risk, to, to risk uh, uh, if you want to give the agent more capital, uh, more than one for one, okay? So basically more than, more than proportionate. You have to basically, uh, you have to offset the increase in the, in the precautionary motive. And that's why moving in the opposite direction is, uh, uh, actually makes the, the contract better, okay? But then you could do things even better if, uh, if you realize that uh, there is a difference between uh, the current risk exposure and the future risk exposure. So you can, um, You can give the agent more capital right now, okay? Uh, so, but you can at the same time reduce the precautionary motive by promising distortions of the future. And uh, this ends up being uh, efficient, okay? So, so anyway, so I think this is uh, too much intuition. I think we should uh, talk about some, some math, okay? So, um, Okay, so we have to consider um, all types of contracts, and out of all types of contracts, we have to figure out what is the optimal contract. Um, and uh, so out of all contracts, we want to ask the questions, well, what kinds of contracts are incentive compatible? Um, and uh, in order to uh, answer this question, we basically have to introduce variables that uh, um, summarize the agent's incentives. So in, in any contract, we can basically define the agent's uh, continuation utility. And uh, uh, in any contract, we can look and at what the agent is consuming. Okay. 
And uh, it has to be that uh, uh, the, the agent's continuation utility responds to performance uh, strongly enough uh, so that the uh, first order condition with respect to uh, cache diversion holds. Okay. And uh, this condition, the intuition is that uh, if the agent diverts a, a dollar, this decreases his utility by delta, but uh, uh, a dollar of return scaled up by the amount of capital that he manages, and this is the cost of diversion, and uh, this is the marginal utility at which he can consume a diverted dollar. This is the benefit that the agent gets from a diverted dollar. Okay. Uh, and the incentive constraint with respect to savings is just the Euler equation. It's a condition that the uh, agent's consumption process has to be such that uh, the marginal utility of consumption is a martingale. So basically, it's, it's a condition that's there. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, so, so this is the agent's utility, but in real life, uh, we don't think about utils, we think about dollars. Okay. And in this setting, because the agent is managing some dollar amount and he's consuming dollars, it's also uh, convenient to uh, transform uh, utility from utils into dollars. And basically for CRRA utility, this is uh, the transformation. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so it's useful to look at the principles problem uh, exploiting scale invariance uh, and uh, basically expressing the uh, agent's utility uh, in, in dollars. So this is like a transformation which is similar like certainty equivalent of utility. Uh, and uh, the way that uh, uh, by introducing X, uh, we can exploit scale invariance. How? It's because we can measure the agent's uh, consumption uh, relative to X. So if, uh, if the agent has a higher utility in dollars, so proportionately he, he should have a greater consumption. Uh, and also if uh, X is higher, then the agent can be given more capital. So basically K can be higher. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, the ratio of uh, consumption to utility, it captures the agent's precautionary motive. So, so in fact, this variable, it, uh, um, uh, how much the agent consumes relative to his future utility, okay? Uh, that variable cannot be uh, bigger than this upper bound. So there is an upper bound in this variable. So you uh, could, yeah. I wonder if you could help us understand you know, what, would, what would go, become more difficult Mm -hmm. Presumably, though, this particular functional form is useful. You keep saying scale invariance. Right. I don't see yet. You, you see what I'm saying? You, so, so with exponential utility, um, so it's a, a constant absolute risk aversion. Yeah. Um, exponential utility is actually, uh, you know, much easier to work with than any other utility function. So with exponential utility, um, you know, things will be even, even uh, easier. So there's a more general class of utilities that you could, that you could handle rather than just CR? Rather than just uh, um, something that includes both exponential and, uh, yeah. and CR array. Uh, I mean, I think... So I think that, 
I would guess that th this can be done with Epstein's in utility. Uh, so what would be a class of utilities that includes uh, CRRA and exponential? Hara? Right, 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 right. Well, uh, so I was just saying hyperbolic. Yeah, that's probably the error. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take a look at it. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a look at it. Um, so one advantage of uh, working with uh, CRRA utility is that um, so uh, if somebody wanted to take it to macro, okay, uh, so, so then the uh, constraint that consumption uh, cannot be negative, you know, that becomes you know, fairly important. So basically, uh, uh, in the macro model, um, it's, uh, it sort of like fits existing macro model uh, much better if you can have basically agents who are you know, of different utilities and, uh, and one guy can become you know, twice as, as, uh, as poor, one guy can become you know, twice as rich and basically every, every, the size of everybody follows like a geometric Brownian motion. So, so in that case, uh, uh, CRRA utility is a, is a good utility uh, to work with and, and car utility is a lot more restrictive uh, in that way. Um, Yeah, so, okay. Um, so, um, so we have these variables which we can use to uh, characterize the agent's incentives. And uh, the principal can control the agent's incentives by controlling these variables. Uh, and, uh, uh, and now we are talking about the, the principles problem. So, um, so we can transform variables into uh, basically another set of variables. And uh, for the transformed variables, we have to ask the question, well, uh, how, can the, how can the principle control the transformed variables given the laws of motion of the variables before transformation, okay? And uh, if we have incentive constraints before the transformation, then you also want to ask the question, well, what are the incentive constraints after the transformation, okay? And uh, after the transformation, basically, it's just Ito's formula to get the law of motion of X and uh, the law of motion of, of C hat, okay? And uh, what does it mean, uh, a law of motion? So basically, a, a law of motion is uh, uh, there is a drift of the variable and there is a volatility of the variable. And the drift of the variable reflects uh, the promise keeping constraint. So uh, the agent's promised utility has to satisfy the promise keeping constraint. And that means that uh, uh, the principal has to take into account uh, uh, how much utility he's giving right now, and given how much utility he's giving to the agent right now, what has to be the future expected utility? So basically, this is the expected rate of change of promised utility. This is going to be the drift of, of the variable. Okay. And uh, the drift of uh, this variable, so this variable uh, reflects uh, the promise of safety. So it can, it can grow. It's a ratio of uh, consumption to utility the agent is choosing his consumption, and this reflects the agent's expectation of how uh, safe the contract is going to be. So this, this uh, variable reflects the promise of safety, and it can, uh, uh, it can go up until uh, a certain uh, upper bound. Okay. Uh, and uh, so those are, those are the drifts, okay? So the drift, uh, reflects uh, that the principal has to uh, honor, uh, the principal promises to 
commits to distorting the contract in the future, making it safer for the agent, the principal has to honor uh, this uh, uh, commitment. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the volatility of X is related to uh, incentives. Uh, so the uh, incentive constraint comes from the sensitivity of utility to uh, returns. This is the sensitivity of uh, uh, X to, uh, to output. And basically, the, in, in terms of the transformed variables, this is the incentive constraint. Okay, so as before, there is a linear relationship between uh, the agent's risk exposure and the amount of capital that the agent gets to manage. Uh, except for, uh, for an additional term, which depends on the precautionary motive. So precautionary motive also enters the, the incentive constraint. Okay. Uh, so, so the principal's problem is basically a control problem uh, where the principal is uh, controlling the variables that, uh, uh, that characterize the agent's incentives. So uh, the principal has to uh, respect his promises with respect to those variables. Uh, and uh, one feature of this control problem is that um, uh, so there are effectively three choices here. Okay. So two of the choices is uh, the the controls how how the how the principal controls these variables. Okay. And uh, the third choice is the uh, initial choice of uh, uh, of safety. Okay. So. There is an initial choice of how much utility to give to the agent. And this is not really a principal's choice because it's determined by the initial constraint. Okay. Uh, and then there is also initial choice of uh, how much safety to promise to the agent. And this is, this is really a choice. Okay. So uh, the principal chooses to commit to uh, making a, a contract for the agent sufficiently safe to reduce the agent's uh, precautionary motive and, and to improve uh, the uh, incentive constraint. And uh, there is a trade-off in the choice of uh, uh, safety, okay? So the, the principal can promise to make the contract safer. And what this does is uh, this relaxes the incentive constraint of the agent ex ante. So that means that, uh, that the agent is uh, less concerned about uh, risk exposure in the future. He has less incentives to basically steal and save. Okay. Uh, but uh, but if, the agent prom if the principal promises to make the contract safer for the agent, then the principal has to honor this uh, promise in the future by uh, uh, not exposing the agent to risk by giving the agent uh, 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 less capital in the future. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, so there are three choices. One of the choices, which is only made at time zero, how much, uh, how to set C hat zero. And then there are two controls which are chosen dynamically. So C hat H is uh, the upper bound for C hat, which corresponds to the, com the completely safe contract. So is that exogenous? Yeah, it, uh, there is a formula for C hat H for uh, CRA oh, utility. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, can, we can think about C hat as safety. Uh, promise safety, and this is the maximal, the highest uh, promised safety. Okay. So, uh, so what do the controls do? Okay. So let me talk about this control, uh, sigma x. So this is a control which uh, gives the agent incentives, um, which. Uh, which allow the principal to give the agent more capital. Okay. 
So basically, uh, one way how this is the, the agent's risk exposure, right? One way how the risk exposure helps is it enters the incentive constraint, so uh, the principal can give the agent more capital. Okay. So risk exposure basically raises, raises uh, short-term profits. Okay. That's, uh, that's one effect of risk exposure. But then there is also uh, the cost of risk exposure because uh, the agent is risk averse, he doesn't like risk. And how it shows up in these formulas here is basically this is, this is the second point where it shows up. Uh, and what happens there is that the, um, uh, when the agent is exposed to risk, then uh, he doesn't like risk, so you have to pay him more in the future. Uh, so basically this, uh, uh, this increases the drift of uh, X, which reflects the utility in money. This is how much the, the right. Uh, and then the, there's a, because of hidden savings, there's a third effect of risk exposure, right, which is, which is here. And how to interpret it is basically, well, it pushes up uh, C hat. It pushes up C hat. And so uh, if the principal pushes C hat all the way to the upper bound, then it means that the principal cannot expose the agent to any risk. So uh, sigma X uses up the budget of safety. Okay. So the principal promises some, some safety uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the principal exposes the agent to, to too much risk and, and exhaust the budget, then to honor this promise, the contract from then on has to be completely safe. So that's basically the three effects of uh, sigma X. Okay. And, and then let me talk about uh, sigma C hat. So this is um, more subtle. Okay. So um, what does it mean? So the meaning of uh, sigma C hat is uh, uh, after good performance, is the contract getting safer or riskier? Okay. So if sigma C hat is uh, negative, uh, it means that after good performance, uh, C hat will go down after good performance, so the contract gets riskier, and C hat goes up after bad performance, so after bad performance, the contract gets safer. So I want to argue at this point that uh, the principle should uh, set sigma C hat to be uh, negative, okay? Uh, and uh, um, so, um, I guess I have a basic question. Yeah. These controls can yeah. depend on the entire history of the past? These controls, they um, reflect the agent's expectation of the future. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, Yeah, they have to be they have to be measurable with respect to the principal's information. Yeah, so they reflect the agent's expectations of the future. They reflect uh, the um, so the principal is managing the agent's expectations. He promises, okay, I'm going to give you this much utility, and I'm going to make the contract so safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then those two promises they determine the agent's incentives. Okay, uh, how much to save and how much. Uh, and whether to steal or, or not to steal. And now the principal has to honor those promises. And in order to honor those promises, basically these are, he has to respect these laws of motion. Okay. Right, but, both, but the sigma XT could depend on a rich history of things before T, right? So, so sigma X, how can the principal control sigma XT? So the principal can control sigma XT by, by saying, okay, so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a contract which, which gives you this much more utility if, if the output is good right now, and I'm going to give you a contract 
that gives you this much less utility if the contract is better. You know, that's how the principal controls uh, sigma, sigma x. And now when tomorrow comes and, and the principal has to give the corresponding utility, then the principal can decide, okay, you know, how I promised to the agent this utility, what's the best way to give this utility? Yeah? So that's the, that's the logic here. Um, so, um, so, okay, so one, so uh, the optimal contract is going to have a feature that after good performance it gets riskier and after bad performance it gets safer, okay? And uh, let me explain it why this is the case you, from the point of view of, of intuition. So the intuition, remember that the principal wants to uh, reduce the agent's precautionary motive, okay? Um, and uh, uh, in order to reduce the agent's precautionary motive, the principal has to distort. Distortion is costly. So the question is, when is best to distort? In the sense, when is distortion going to have the highest benefit and the lowest cost? Okay. And uh, after the agent performs uh, uh, well, uh, distortion is costly. It has, it has a cost because uh, after the agent performs well, the scale goes up. And so if you distort uh, on a bigger scale, that's more costly. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that's the, the cost in terms of profit. Uh, but then you also care about the benefit. You care about distortion. How does it affect the, the agent's precautionary motive? And the agent's precautionary motive is biggest uh, about uh, uh, failure. Okay, so he's concerned about failure and he wants to basically save to protect himself against, against failure. And, and so, so that's why the biggest benefit of distortion is after, um, uh, after bad performance. Uh, because after bad performance, uh, it's best to, okay, you punish the agent, but at the same time, uh, after that, you make things safe, so that uh, 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 so that basically you you mitigate the precautionary motive. So basically, sigma c hat has a mitigating effect. Okay, and sigma c hat uh, uh, has to be negative. And how to see it in the formulas is that well, uh, this is a, a positive number. If the agent is exposed to risk, then you use up the budget of safety. But uh, you use up the budget of safety less if sigma c hat is negative. So that's the math. So is it, I guess, just changing sigma c hat, leaving sigma x fixed, doesn't change the agent's utility, right? Uh, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you're making it riskier, but also adjusting the drift of consumption so the utility is constant. Yeah, so, so, so your observation is actually a very nice one. Your observation basically is that, uh, okay, you know, utility is one thing, right? And if, and if you want to give the agents utility, you can give it in different ways. You can give it in a safer way, or you can give it in a, in a riskier way, and that's another dimension. Right? So basically what you're doing is you're actually separating those dimensions. Exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, okay. So, but, but, you know, those are, those are the formulas. Okay. So now, um, so what are, so, what are, what are the takeaways fr from this? Uh, so the takeaways from this is that um, the, the principal wants to, okay, let me maybe uh, put, put this, uh, this graph and, uh, and explain what are the takeaways. Um, so there is an other key solution, okay? So relative to that, how can the principal improve? So the principle can improve basically by uh, um, by creating distortions, 
that uh, uh, weaken the agent's precautionary motive, and he wants to put those distortions in the, uh, in the cheapest and most effective way. Okay? Um, and what those distortions are going to do? Well, those distortions are going to lower the agent's precautionary motive and improve the incentive constraint and allow the, the, the uh, principal to give the agent more capital up front and uh, to also provide the agent with insurance. Okay. So, so relative to other key, uh, this is the optimal contract. So the optimal contract is going to be safer uh, relative to other key. And uh, the optimal contract is, is going to be uh, uh, attained by uh, promising some, some safety in the future, by creating some distortions in the future. So that means that uh, this is uh, C hat right now. Uh, and C hat in the future is going to be uh, safer because, the, the, because there will be more distortions in the future. Uh, and uh, um, and and those distortions are uh, there will, will be not only more distortions in the future, but there also will be um, more distortions in the future, particularly after bad performance. So after bad performance, the uh, C hat will be uh, will be even higher. Uh, so, uh, so how to think about um, how to think about these this, this distortions, the agent's risk exposure? So, we can think about the agent's risk exposure as basically this is the portfolio weight on the um, on the. Uh, and the risky assets or the, the leverage of the, of the fund. Okay. Um, and there is going to be some leverage uh, in Autarchy. Okay. Um, and uh, relative to, uh, relative to Autarchy, in the optimal contract, there will be more leverage. Okay. So basically, the agent will be at the, at the beginning. The agent will be initially on the hot seat uh, and uh, he can be given uh, more capital, but he's not going to be on the hot seat forever. So he can be given more capital initially because in the future there will be distortions, which, which are helpful. So that basically that's the uh, feature of the optimal contract. Okay. Um, okay. So um, last thing I wanted to talk about is that these incentive constraints, they, are, uh, they guarantee that the agent doesn't want to deviate by stealing only, and, and they guarantee that the agent does not want to deviate by saving only, but uh, double deviations could still be profitable, okay? Um, and uh, in order to uh, rule out these double deviations, okay, what we need to do is we basically need to bound from above the, uh, the agent's utility of equilibrium path. So we have to uh, find a bound uh, on the utility that the agent gets if he has uh, savings. Okay. And uh, we found out that basically there is a bound like this which works. Uh, and the sufficient condition for this is basically that uh, uh, sigma c hat is negative which uh, is satisfied in the optimal contract because uh, that's just the property that the contract gets uh, safer after bad performance. Okay. So this is something that the principal wants to do anyways, but this also uh, ends up being a sufficient condition for the agent. Okay. So what's the intuition why this is a sufficient condition for the agent? The intuition why this is a sufficient condition for the agent is that uh, uh, this is about uh, stealing and saving. Okay. Um, and uh, if the agent steals, his performance is worse, okay? Uh, so uh, when is, what, is the, what is the value of uh, savings if he steals? So his performance is worse, okay? But if uh, sigma c hat is negative, 
then the contract is actually safer uh, when performance is worse. So, so savings are worth, are worth less. Okay, so basically that's the intuition. So if this condition holds, then after bad performance, savings are worth less, okay, because the contract is safer. So stealing and saving is, is not optimal, okay. And this is an upper bound, okay, and basically it, it uh, uh, the agent is supposed to get X on the equilibrium path, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there is no deviation which gives him more than X. So basically this proves that uh, um, this is a fully incentive compatible contract. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh, and I wanted to go through the proof that this is really an upper bound, but I'm, uh, you know. Uh, So H, H, T is savings. Okay, so this is an upper bound. I see, so you're saying it doesn't save. So H, T now we know is negative. Uh, so H, T is zero. So if H, T is zero, then the agent gets X. Okay, uh, if the agent accumulates some, some H, then uh, according to this bound, it's, uh, it's a linear bound in, uh, in X. But this, remember that this is in a transformed space. So this is in the money space and not in the... Uh, and and one, of the, one of the things to notice is that the value of uh, hidden savings is given by uh, C hat to the power minus gamma, okay? So if the contract is safer, so C hat is bigger, it means that the value of hidden savings is less. So... So, so basically, one way to think about it is that the principle is going to distort and uh, to push down the, the agent's entire value function of, of hidden savings. But, uh, 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 but first order effect, uh, first, first order condition as it being sufficient. So, uh, okay. So um, let me conclude because I'm out of time. I wanted, really wanted to go through this proof, but um, I didn't ma manage my time very well. Okay, so, um, so this is a, a classic finance setting. Uh, there's a moral hazard and uh, uh, there are hidden savings. Uh, and uh, this is a specific uh, uh, fund manager uh, problem, but the takeaway is, is generally for you know, any agent that's given some, some, some resources. Uh, uh, so moral hazard problem is a uh, scale invariant, uh, and uh, uh, because the moral hazard problem is scale invariant, it's easier to study the the savings problem. And the savings problem comes in the form of the of creating distortions, which. Uh, 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 reduce the leverage of the fund and uh, make the contract uh, safer for the agent, okay? Um, and uh, distortions in the future um, are beneficial because they improve uh, incentives ex ante. Uh, but of course, distortions are costly. Um, and so the principal wants to create these distortions, uh, these distortions uh, most effectively and it's most effective to, to um, have distortions when you have the, the biggest bang for the buck, okay? Uh, and that means that uh, the principal wants to distort after bad performance. So after bad performance, these are the events where the agent is most concerned about uh, uh, risk. And uh, these are also the events where the scale is, uh, uh, is is, is lower and it's, it's costlier to distort on a bigger scale than to distort on a smaller scale. So the, the uh, principle distorts on a smaller scale. Okay, um, so let me finish.